Good morning, Cable First Baptist Church. It's the 11 o'clock hour. We're certainly glad to see everybody here this morning. In case you read lips, let me take my, my thing off. I'm more than six feet from anybody. Our first time to have people back in the uh, congregation this morning. Certainly glad to see uh, people in the seats. Uh, it's an uh, unusual time, to say the least, but uh, we're going to get through it. We're certainly glad that you've uh, tuned in from home to be with us this morning as we worship the Lord. Uh, several things on our announcements this morning. Uh, let's start with a couple of thank you notes that we have received. Uh, one from Isaac Chandler Church for uh, some school activities. We thank Isaac, and I'll have both these posted on the bulletin board in the back. Uh, and uh, Savannah, Lonnie, and Sabrina, Kevill First Baptist Church, thank you for paying for the chaperones for camp. Since camp was canceled, we're returning the payment. Uh, we want to remember and support our youth during this time. As a lot of things are different this year, things that people remember them uh, as, we, as we move forward. Uh, in our prayer request this morning, been asked to uh, add Chris Jenkins. Uh, Chris will be going for some uh, heart doctor uh, consultation this week, thoughts and prayers. And we will remember our shut-ins. Uh, but, uh, you know, a phone call does wonders for the soul sometimes. So, uh, not only does it bless the one that received it, but a lot of times it'll, it'll do a lot of good for the person that sends it as well. On that. Um, this morning, uh, we want to talk a little bit our uh, children's sermon. I, I was just really thinking about this and I thought, well, we'll have them on the front. We're going to uh, use something of the season. I went out this morning and picked those. I love picking strawberries. Now, it's not a real pretty sight. I mean, I may be kneeling for a while. I may be down on my hands and knees. I may lay down. <laughs> you, know, you know, by the time you get to the end of the road, you think, oh my gosh, my back. I've seen this truck come in early. And uh, said the guy's truck, he parked at one end of the patch, you know, and, and Gene pulled in, so the guy was standing at the other end of the patch. He said, well, they must have picked all the berries yesterday because I can't find any anywhere. Gene said he threw his two containers out there and picked two quarts within 20 feet of that guy's truck. He said, you know, when you lay it late that, it's kind of like scripture. <coughs> you know, strawberries are a beautiful fruit, but you've got to part the leaves to find them sometimes. They don't just jump out and jump into your container and say, let's go home. You know, and that's a lot. If we, we look at our scripture, and I left it back there, I think it was Matthew 7, 7 and 8 is what I had picked this morning. Uh, if you look at that, it talks about you seek and you shall find. And that's what I thought about. You know, you've got to seek that strawberry. It don't just jump into your bucket. Well, a lot of times in Christian Christianity, in our Christian lives, we have to seek out God. God gives us a choice. He allows us to make our, our own decision. But we have to seek him and ask for his forgiveness. So just think about that this week as you're in the strawberry patch and you're looking and I, I just can't find any. Well, maybe maybe you've got to look a little harder. And if you're not really feeling the blessings that maybe you think that uh, you would like to receive, maybe you just need to look a little harder and ask God for those blessings and that forgiveness. So All right, so that's something to think about. Uh, and we're going to send these home. And if Miss Sherry's working, Miss Sherry, the Brother Tim's bringing these home. Make sure they get home so that you get some of them. Thank you. Good morning from Kevill First Baptist Church. Good morning. Good to have everybody back. <laughs> morning, everybody. Good to see all your smiling uh, masks. <laughs> I was going to say smiling faces, but you got them covered up. But I know you're smiling behind them, okay? And this is a lot better than singing to empty pews, too, isn't it? Yes, it, yeah, this is a lot better than singing to empty pews. I love that. Let's do it for you. One, two? Yeah, let's do it.
singing, just all crammed together in one song. Hope you like it. There you ought to count how many. <laughs> if anybody gets more than 14, hold your hand up, okay? <laughs> all right, here we go, ready? Ready, Mr. Jim? Yeah, ready. Here we go. One, two, three, four. His blood was shed for me. I'll trust and obey, cause there's victory in Jesus. One day I'll fly away. Well, those good old gospel songs, they always touch my heart. Like there's power in the blood of the Lamb. My life was made whole. On the day he saved my soul, I gave it all to him and saved just as I am. Feel blessed assurance in the sweet hour of prayer. When that rose call to be under, I know that I'll be there. Well, those good old gospel songs, they always touch my heart. Like there's power in the blood of the Lamb. My life was made whole. On the day you saved my soul, I gave it all to you. Song she wrote. Oh, it happens. <laughs> Keep you humble. <laughs> oh, I'm humble. The good thing about writing your own song is if you mess it up, they'll think you wrote it that way. Yeah. I should have kept my mouth shut. <laughs> All right, here we go. One more.
that great and noble day. Some will hear the Father say, Depart from me, for I know you not. But everyone who's on the right side, he'll invite to go inside. Praise by Calvary from every spot. So if you ever want to be on the right side, When you go through that crimson flow, it will wash you white as snow. You'll be on the right side of the great I am. When you go through that crimson flow, it will wash you white as We'll do it another time. <laughs> yeah. Technical difficulties. Hope it wasn't something I did. <clears throat> All right. Come to you this morning on behalf of the Kevill First Baptist Church Pastor Search Committee. Uh, I know you haven't heard from us in a long time. Uh, I think we have just been through probably the longest trial sermon in Kevill First Baptist history. <laughs> but uh, I think we've been blessed by the individual that we've had during this trial and tribulation with us. Brother Tim has done an excellent job in, in leading the congregation and uh, things that we've done and the expertise that he has with uh, multimedia and things that have made it available for a lot of people that would have just been cut off from a worship service to, uh, to enjoy and, and be able to participate. So what we're looking at at this time, the Pastor Search Committee has met with Brother Tim on three different occasions, and, and uh, we have been after him from sort of the get-go, and I will tell you uh, this, that he is a very humble individual, and I think he's put a lot of prayer and consideration into this offer, into this call. Uh, he's had a lot of questions for us. We've had some questions for him, but uh, uh, we are certainly uh, pleased to present him to the church uh, for the church's consideration for our next pastor at Kevill First Baptist Church. Now, the way this will happen is uh, we are making that announcement today, two Sundays from today, and I believe is that June 7th? June 7th, that morning at 11 o'clock, we will have the vote on whether to call. And we encourage as many church members as can to be present, but if you're unable to be present, uh, 
we have thought about different ways that we could do that. We want everybody to have their vote counted. Uh, we don't believe there'll be any voter fraud. So if you want to call one of the members of the committee and that being uh, myself, Bob Middleton, or Charlotte Sullivan, if you want to call one of us that morning and cast your vote, we'd be happy to put it in for you uh, by, by your wishes. And then we'll make that uh, announcement at the close of the service on the 7th. So uh, I believe that Brother Tim is available. You know, traditionally, you know, everybody gathers after one of these in the fellowship hall and we have a question and answer session. Well, I think he's been here with us since December. I think we've pretty much got that covered. But uh, he has... Uh, We'll make himself available. If you have questions, you can call him, you can email him, text him, or, or he would said he would even meet with you in person to answer any questions that you might have. So uh, with uh, our humble consideration, we present Brother Tim Bertram uh, for your consideration as the next pastor at Kelvin First Baptist Church. Morning, church. Good morning. I knew this was good path. <laughs> Thank you. Man, you're beautiful. Amen. So good to see you. And for those of you all that uh, are at home, you are beautiful as well. So glad that you've joined us this morning. Listen, I didn't think we'd ever get here, right? God is good. Amen. He is faithful. And this has not been an easy journey by any stretch of the imagination. It has come with its fair share of challenges along the way. But we have kept our focus on the Father, right? And the journey continues, right? The journey continues as we uh, come back today. It's kind of the first step, and we're taking baby steps. We're not, uh, I am not a baby step kind of guy. I am cliff diving, jump off in the deep part right out of the gate, right? And uh, sometimes that's good. A lot of times that's good, but I felt in this situation, the way we're approaching this, I think it's, it's what's best for the folks at Campbell First Baptist as we kind of re-entry, you know, in, enter uh, church and our, and our life and our fellowship together. And so um, I, uh, I'll just, I, I didn't want to take a whole lot of time on this, uh, but uh, I am, uh, I'm honored and, and I'm, I'm very humbled that, uh, the search team that you as a body have, uh, you know, allowed me and gave me this opportunity. Uh, my sermon today uh, is one that's very, very personal. It's, it's real fresh. It, there, there's some fresh wounds, but uh, this kind of fits into the whole picture of what I'm actually preaching about today. And uh, if you would have asked me a couple of years ago, uh, that if I would even consider being an interim pastor or interim anything anywhere, I would have looked at you and, and said, you are out of your minds. But it just goes to display the grace of God. And what God can do and how he can heal hurt and how he can bring a person back around and... and uh, Put them in a place that I never would have imagined. Never would have imagined. And I'm so, I'm so honored and humbled. But more than anything, over these next couple of weeks, this is what I ask of you. That you pray and you seek the face of God. Because it's God's will more than anything. It's what God wants for you all here at Keppel first. And if that's me, that's what I want. And that's what I want to be. And that's where I want to be. Because I don't need to be anyplace else. And so you, you seek the Father and you pray. Pray for me, pray for my wife, pray for us as we continue on. And uh, I, uh, I, I, you know, I, I, will, I will love you. 
I will serve you and, and I will stand on the word of God and I will continue to preach the word of God. And, and honestly, that's all I know to do. A lot of stuff is new and will be new. And uh, we'll just have to grow together and be patient with one another. And so uh, I am, I'm excited, though. I'm so excited. And, uh, but I've got a message to preach this morning. And so I want to kind of get on to that, if, if we can, this morning. As I've been, uh, let me just look at you again. <laughs> just look around. I, he, no, don't you cover that beautiful face up back there, and Brother Tommy. That's that's a beautiful. I, let me tell you what. That's a beautiful face. I mean, she's trying to cover him up there. I'm like, let, let me let me look at everybody, and uh, even even I tell you what, it's so good. It's so good, and for you at home, man, we we miss you. We understand, and and that's been our goal from the beginning, never to to rush anyone or shame anyone. I you I can't believe you. You know, listen, we we get it. And you come back when, when you feel like you're comfortable to come back. And, uh, but we're together. Whether we're here or whether you're at home, uh, you know, some of y'all had to get, uh, you didn't come in your pajamas. And, and, you know, I thought about saying, hey, everybody just come. I want to see what the other side of the camera looks like. So just come to church as you normally come. And then I thought, that might not be good. <laughs> But uh, we're continuing on uh, with this series called uh, A Living. And, and I tell you what, when I started planning this series, I did not, uh, you know, sometimes think, you know, God just lays things into place. And, and, and this sermon, uh, just with the timing of today and coming back together today and how this, this sermon came into play, it's just God's timing. And, and I feel it's of God because I feel this Subject. I'm, I'm speaking on forgiveness this morning. I think it's just a huge, huge thing that, that we need to open up and unpack. And, and we probably all have our own stories about how we've been hurt by other people. Uh, we, we, there, there's some, you know, we're, we're still struggling with some things, or maybe it was in the past, and, and, and we've got our stories of, of hurt. And, and almost 10 years ago, there was an incident that happened to me that almost destroyed me. It, I was hurt so bad that I honestly did not think I would recover from it, and I almost didn't. And I'm not going to elaborate on any of the details of that situation because I did not want to take away from the focus of the message. But I will say that I've never experienced hurt on that level before. I became depressed. I became angry. I was bitter. And I was a miserable human to my family and everyone that I came in contact with. And as the weeks and the months and the years rolled by... My spiritual condition became worse as I hung on to the hurt and I refused to forgive. About three years later, I was more miserable than ever and I was meeting with a friend and I was talking about what had happened and how I could not let it go and I couldn't get over it. And he said, I'm going to use a word and it's a word that's not used very much. And I want you to tell me if this word describes what you're going through. And the word was torment. And he asked me, do you feel tormented? And I almost fell out of my chair. Like someone had hit me right square between the eyes with a hammer. It described my spiritual and emotional and physical state right down to a T. And then he shared a parable from Matthew. And it's a parable that I had read before. I'd heard sermons about before, but I'd never heard it taught in the context of forgiveness and what it truly means to not forgive. And this sermon I want to share with you today, it came out of that conversation. And this passage really saved my life because I was in torment and I was getting worse. You see, my story is not one of bitterness and hurt, but it is a story about forgiveness and grace and how God showed me how wrong I was. And he showed me that if I forgave those that wronged me, I could find freedom from the prison that I had built for myself. And this morning, it is my hope that if you've been hurt and you find it difficult to forgive, that you will allow the Holy Spirit to break through the pain 
and bring freedom to your life today. So if you have your Bibles, if you would turn to Matthew's Gospel, the 18th chapter, Matthew 18, and we'll be reading verses 21 through 35. I had put the sermon handout on the YouTube, uh, version app, and uh, uh, we're trying not to pass anything out, and so I have notes on the screen, so if you're going to take notes, but I want to read the scripture first before we dive into the notes. Uh, 18 verses 21 through 35. Then Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times. And Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but seventy-seven times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle account with his servants. And when he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. And since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold and his, with his wife and his children all that he had in payment to be made. So the servant fell on his knees imploring him, have patience with me, I will pay you everything. And out of the pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, Pay what you owe. So this fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience with me, I will pay you. And he refused and went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. And when his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed. And they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. Verse 32. Then his master summoned him and said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave all that debt because you pleaded with me. And should you not have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in his anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. So also my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. So that's a pretty, pretty powerful passage of scripture there. And, and, and number one on your handout is refusing to forgive will torment you. Refusing to forgive will torment you. And I want to look at the context of our story. In verses 15 through 20, Jesus is teaching about how to handle conflict if a brother sins against you. And then in verse 21, Peter starts out by asking Jesus this question. How many times should I forgive someone? Would seven times be enough? Now, we might think, where did he get that number? And that's kind of really a little odd thing to ask. But see, here's the thing. Peter knew that the Pharisees said that men were only required to forgive someone up to three times. After that, you could hold on to that grudge. If you forgive them three times, you're good. You fulfilled the, the Pharisees' law. So Peter thinks he's being extremely generous with his forgiveness with seven times. So he's thinking, well, if the Pharisees say three times, I'll really impress Jesus by saying seven times, right? But Jesus replied, not seven, but seven times 70, 490. Now, Jesus is not using a set number to answer Peter. Peter's like, well, okay, I'll forgive 490 times. But then at 491st, I'm good to go. I don't have to forgive. Then I can hold on to the grudge. That's not what Jesus is saying. Jesus says you can't put a number on it. You keep forgiving. And then that's when Jesus tells them a parable about the unforgiving servant. And as we've studied parables enough, I've mentioned every time, you know, usually a parable has been, it's a response to a question that's usually asked from the crowd or even the disciples. And this is, you know, Peter sets the stage for the parable. And he tells them a parable about an unforgiving servant. And one day a wealthy king decided to settle his accounts with those who owed him money. And there was one servant who owed him 10,000 talents. Now the numbers are very, very important here because it's a comparison of great debt to little debt. 10,000 talents represents a huge amount of money that can't be calculated or repaid. In today's terms, 10,000 talent would be equivalent to about $6 billion. With a B, all right? So this first man, let's just say, he owed him a lot of money, and there was no way that he could ever pay off that debt. He couldn't work it off. He couldn't repay it. It was an impossibility. And the servant, he didn't have the ability to pay this debt. So the king ordered all the man's belongings to be sold 
and the man and his wife and his children, sell them into slavery, whatever we can get and collect, that will go towards helping pay off his debt. Listen, the king knew that there's no way that he was going to recoup his losses. I'm just going to get what I can. And then in verse 26, the servant pleaded, and he said, please, please have patience or give me more time and I will pay it back. Now, notice in this passage of Scripture, he didn't ask for forgiveness. What he asked for was more time, which both he and the king knew that he didn't have enough time to pay that back. He's like, give me more time, right? Well, you can work all you want, night and day, noon. You don't have enough lifetime to even make this kind of money to pay it back. But notice what happened in verse 27. And said, out of pity for him, or out of compassion, the master of that servant released him, and he forgave him the debt. He forgave him and released him. The king absorbed this man's debt. He wrote it off. The servant had asked for more time, but the king, he wiped his slate clean. Now, in verse 28, the story transitions, and we find that this recently forgiven servant finds a fellow servant that owes him money. Now, this man owed him a, den a debt of 100 denarii. Now, a denarius equaled one day's pay. So this debt was about 20 weeks of wages, or roughly $12,000 in our current economy. It's not a small debt, but it's still a lot less than $6 billion. This debt was manageable, and it could be paid off in time. So in verse 28, the servant that had just been forgiven grabs this man and begins to choke him and says, Give me my money. And the man made the same plea that he had used. He said, have patience and I will repay you. And this time, there was a chance that he could actually pay it back. But in verse 30, we find this man that had received forgiveness from the king. He said no, and he had him thrown in prison. And when the other servants saw what had happened, they went and they told the king. And this is where it gets real. Verses 32 through 34. He calls for the man, and he declared him a wicked servant. And he turned him over to be to the jailer until his debt was repaid. Now, the word jailer, uh, you probably, when you think of jailer, you got something that comes in mind. It's, it's the person that's over the jail, right? He's over the inmates. Well, that word jailer translates to torturer or tormentor. And, and he's not your average, ordinary, hey, I'm a jailer over the inmates. I, you know, like Andy and Barney, like Otis lets himself in, right? <clears throat> right? On Saturday night. Not what he's talking about. This is not just the guy that's in charge of inmates, but he has a special skill set. And in the ancient world, torture was often used in order to force people to reveal sources of money that could be used to repay their debts. And in the jail or in the prison, they had men who were specifically trained in the art of torture. And they were skilled in subjecting a person to as much pain as possible without killing them. The torture or the torment was to continue until the debt was repaid. Which brings me back to the question that my friend asked me, do you feel tormented? To which I answered, yes, yes, I've never thought of that word. It, it describes me to a T. It was a perfect description of what was happening to me. See, what happens is, is when you do not forgive others, when I do not forgive others, we live in torment. There's a couple of things that's important to note here of what Jesus is not saying in this parable, okay? Because uh, people draw speculation. But I, I want to say this. This is not what Jesus is saying. Jesus is not saying that a person will lose their salvation, okay? He, he's not saying, you know, somebody loses their salvation. He's not returning to eternal forgiveness where he forgives our sins. Psalms 103, 12. He does not uh, treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. As far as the east from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. He's not talking about the eternal forgiveness where he's forgiven us of our sins, but rather to the earthly relational benefits of his forgiveness. Jesus is also not saying that God the Father tortures us. You see, the Father judges mankind and he disciplines his children, but he does not torture them. The king in the parable did not torture the servant, but he turned him over to the tormentor who did. 
You see, the Father simply withholds his protection from us and gives the enemy and his henchmen the legal authority to do the tormenting. God withholds his protection when we do not forgive, and he unleashes his protection when we do forgive. You see, there is a link between God's forgiveness of us with our forgiveness of others. In the Lord's Prayer found in Matthew 6, 19 through 13, Jesus says, And forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. And Jesus says, If we forgive others, our Father will forgive us. But if we do not forgive others, He will not forgive us. Matthew 6, 14 through 15. Once again, this does not mean if you are saved and you do not forgive, you cannot go to heaven. He's referring to God's pardon in our lives on earth. In Mark 11, 25 through 26, Jesus teaches the same truth. He says, whenever you stand praying, forgive if you have anything against anyone so that your Father in heaven will also forgive you your transgressions. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father who is in heaven forgive your transgressions. You see, when we refuse to forgive others, God turns you over to the enemy to be tormented. And refusing to forgive opens the door to a pretty miserable existence. I, I know. I learned this the hard way. I lived that life. To which I ask you this morning, are you tormented? Are there people that have hurt you that you refuse to forgive? And, and do you want to be free? Now, forgiveness is a process now. It, it may depend upon who hurt you or how deep the transgression against you was. But I want to tell you, the longer you hold on to the unforgiving in your heart, the more it hurts you. Which brings us to number two. If you go ahead and throw number two up on our screen there. Forgiven people forgive others. Forgiven people forgive others. An unwillingness to forgive is a sign that we have devalued God's forgiveness of us. In the parable, the king forgave the servant a debt that he could never repay. In life, Jesus has forgiven our sin debt to which we can never repay. In this parable, Jesus is using hyperbole to make a comparison to Peter and to us. He is comparing our sin debt, which we cannot even come close to paying, to the smaller things that we refuse to forgive others you see, Peter really thought he was stepping up his forgiveness game by going seven times. And Jesus says, let me put this in perspective for you, Peter, because I'm dying on the cross for your sins. You can be forgiven your sin debt. And if God forgives you your sin debt, then you must forgive others that commit far lesser transgressions against you. We as followers of Christ, we have been forgiven a debt that was impossible for us to pay. We must forgive others when they hurt us. But I mean, you might be sitting there thinking, but you don't know what they've done to me. I want to tell you that hurt is hurt. And hurt is real. Pain is real. And stomach, some of that stuff, it hurts real, real bad. And I'm sorry that you have had to go through that or that you're going through it now. Because we can't ignore the hurt. But no matter what has been done to us, it does not compare to what our sins did to Jesus on the cross. The comparison in the Bible was the king forgiving the servant's astronomical debt to the servant refusing to forgive the other servant's debt, which was minimal in contrast to what he owed the king and was forgiven for. And according to the scripture, it doesn't matter what someone has done to you. You and I are still called to forgive the other person. You see, the blood of Jesus cleanses all sin, including the ones committed against us. And letter A in our handout says, when you refuse to forgive others, it's you that suffers, not the other person. So, so, and, I, and I wonder about this, and, and I think about this in my own life. Why do we want to hang on to the hurt? What, what do we hope to accomplish or achieve by hanging on to the hurt? Listen, I did it. I kept stuff away. It was, it was visual reminders of what had happened. I kept that, and, and I would pull that mess out and look at it just so I could get mad again. Why do we do that? I was an idiot, right? I don't know I, what the Greek word, you know what the Greek word for idiot is? Idiot. <laughs> 
And that, that's, I'm like, you know, I kept stuff and I would pull it out and I would get mad. And, and maybe, maybe I thought, you know, I, I'd just get some payback. Or, 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 or I, you know, what, what happens? Sometimes we, we, we plead our case, right? We find people, anybody that will listen to us, we usually want to try to find people that will side with us because we really don't want to find anybody that tells us that we're wrong. So we find people that will agree with us, and we plead our case, man. We try to get people to listen, to take our side, and we also in the process want to make that other person look bad. We take to social media. We do all these things. But what happens is we're only hurting ourselves. We're not hurting the other person. We think holding on to the pain and the anger and the hurt will somehow hurt the other person, that they will share in our misery. Listen, chances are the other person may not even know that they hurt you. There's a great possibility that they don't even care that they hurt you. They've moved on with their lives. While the whole time this cancer of unforgiveness rots away inside of you. Let her be. You might be asking, what if the other person won't accept my forgiveness? Well, it's on them, <coughs> not you. You can't force someone to accept, you know, uh, to, to forgive you. You've done what God has called you to do. Listen, in forgiveness, ultimately reconciliation in any relationship is what God's desire. That's what he wants. But in many instances, the other person or persons may not reciprocate or accept your forgiveness. And some relationships don't get reconciled. But you still forgive them and get this, I was told this, and I wasn't too happy about this, but you ask blessings on their lives. I'm like, what? Yes. I got to tell you, what. Well, listen, there's a reason why Jesus said to pray for your enemies. When, when, when you begin to pray blessings for those that hurt you, oh my goodness, you're talking about getting set free. It's just, it, it, it's just counter of what you think. It, it's just, it goes, it goes against everything. Like, no, I would rather drive, you know, some people just need a high five to the face with a chair, right? <laughs> and the last thing I want to do is be praying blessed. I pray something else fall upon them. A house? An automobile? A bus? The blessings? What you talking about with us? <laughs> Some of y'all get that. Some of y'all don't know why. <laughs> I did it on purpose because some of you guys are going to go home. Some of you youngsters are going to go home and Google that. What are you talking about, Willis? <clears throat> but see, we pray blessings for them. How about this one? Let her see. I can forgive, but I can't forget. You know, we always hear that. You got to forgive and forget. I don't know if that's biblical. See, no matter how often the enemy brings it up, you got to remember if you've truly forgiven that offense, it's forgiven. The way our mind works, I, I don't know that we ever forget it, but see, it's how do we react when it's brought up? How do we react when it comes back in our face? How do we react, listen, when you're like at the store and, and you see somebody that, that, that triggers that, that memory or that response or that person that wronged you, how do you respond? Do you roll back into the, you know what, I'm, I'm, I'm angry bird, right? That mode right there and, and it all stews up. Listen, when you truly forgive, that offense is forgiven. See, forgiveness does not say what happened did not matter or that it did not happen. When we forgive others, we're not like saying, you know what, that never happened to me. I'm just la, 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 I'm just going to ignore it and it's going to go away. That, that's not reality. That's not what happens. It's not like it magically disappears. And it's not saying, you know what, if I forgive that person, what happened did not matter. You know, it mattered because it, it affects your life. It changed this. It, listen, it changed the trajectory of my life for a long, long time. Forgiveness does not change the reality of the event. It's just our response to it. We really can't choose to forget something, but we can strive to not dwell on it. We got to let it go. And I got to tell you, church, The moment that it 
You know, I, I, I had forgiven, but there were still little things that hurt, even though I had forgiven. And it wasn't long, maybe a few months ago or so, that I saw the individual, right? And it just clicked with me. It's like, you know what? It's okay. It didn't bother me anymore. That, I, it felt good. It felt good. Well, that brings us to number three. The gospel is about forgiveness. The gospel is about forgiveness. Anywhere you cut the gospel, it bleeds forgiveness. It doesn't matter where you slice it. It's all about forgiveness. That's why Jesus came to earth. God refused to give up on his stubborn, rebellious creation. And before the foundations of the world were laid, Jesus predetermined that he was going to forgive us. No one has ever sinned past the point of Jesus' redemptive work on the cross. It is available to everyone. You see, it makes a difference whether or not we forgive. It reveals whether or not we believe the message of the gospel that we proclaim. How can we go about teaching and preaching and sharing a gospel about forgiveness when we can't ourselves even forget lesser debts from people that have hurt us. It also exposes our attitude towards God. How often we forget the debt we were forgiven of. How often we get mad or we get angry when we're hurt and automatically we forget the king's debt that he just wiped our slate clean. Letter A, number three, says when we forgive, we display the glory of God the Father as well as bring glory to God the Father. We display the glory of God and we bring glory to God. Listen, forgiving others is countercultural. It goes against the culture. See, the world doesn't understand it. And I, I, I was going to look it up, but I forgot. Uh, it wasn't that long ago that the young boy on the news, he, he forgave the people that had like murdered someone in his family. And, and he's like, the, the, man, the press had a field day. You're like, what are you talking about? And he's like, man, he said, the Lord has forgiven me, and, and I'm called to forgive this person. And in the world, anytime something like that happens, anytime somebody is on the news or anytime you see somebody in the press, you know, that chooses to forgive somebody that has really, really wronged them, the world loses their minds. How can you do that? When we forgive, we are imitating our Heavenly Father. And we are demonstrating to the world the core of the gospel. Letter B. Forgiveness is a decision that we must make. Listen, we either forgive and live a life of freedom and the safety and protection of Jesus, or we do not forgive and we're tormented. We have to make that choice. Listen, I pray and thank God that that, that phone conversation that he shook me to the core and he exposed me, my sin, with the scripture. He showed me that. Because I, I could have said, you know what? No, I'm not going to. I'm not going to work through this. I'm not going to forgive. I like being a miserable human being. I like to hold on to the hurt. I like to wallow in the, the, the bitterness and everything. I, I, I like, you know, I, I could have chose that. See, it's a decision that we must make. When we choose to not forgive, we choose to hang on to that hurt. And the torment... And we continue to choose to live in sin and prohibiting God from using us to our God-given potential. And the last letter is C, an unwillingness to forgive as a sin. Refusing to forgive as a sin. This is the bottom line. Sin as at the core of an unforgiving heart. When you strip everything away, listen, it comes back to this. It comes back to just a simple heart. And unless we repent from this way of thinking, we will not be free. You see, Jesus is calling us to make the decision to forgive. 
He's calling us to live in freedom. Church, he wants to live in freedom. He doesn't want us to live in torment and hurt and anger. That's not what he wants for his children. Listen, you that have children and grandchildren, do you want your child living in bitterness and hurt and anger all the time? No, you want them to be free. Our Heavenly Father is no different. He, he wants us to live in freedom, knowing that, listen, we've been forgiven. We've been set free. But what he requires of us is that we forgive others of lesser transgressions. This morning, uh, we're going to have a, we're gonna have time of invitation. This has been kind of like the, we're, we're not going to have an invitation like we typically do. And, and we've been doing invitations at home. But uh, this morning, just right where you're at. If you're here this morning, if you're watching this morning. And you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ if you're not saved. Listen, there's a sin that, 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 that you're, you're responsible for. It's your sin debt. You rack that up. Just like I racked it up, right? And you can't work it off. You don't have enough time. You don't have enough money. There's only one that paid the debt. Jesus paid that debt. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Listen, he, he wiped that debt clean on the cross of Calvary. And if you're here without Jesus, you can know him. You can be forgiven of your sins. You can be set free of that sin debt. But this morning, church, if, if you're hurting, if you're hanging on to the hurt, and if you're refusing to forgive, I ask you this morning just to go to the Father. We repent of that sin. It's a process we go through. And before we can truly live free, before we can truly move on and, 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 and live out our, 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 our God-given potential that he wants us to live, listen, we got to let it go. we got to forgive. Because see, here's the thing. Satan, Satan doesn't want you to forgive. Satan's like, don't do it. Do you know how bad they hurt you? Do you know how bad they humiliated you? Do you know how much they violated your trust? Oh, if you forgive them, you're just letting them off the hook. Listen, God will deal with those people. God will take care of that. That's, that's not for us to take. Listen, we can, that's not for us to do. We just have to trust the Lord. See, Satan doesn't want you doing that. He wants you defeated. He wants you beat up. Beat up. He wants you shackled by the hurt and the pain, the anger. He wants you to be a miserable human. Because in doing so, you're not effective for God. And you can't live free. The enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. I'm going to pray for you this morning. And uh, you just be obedient to God. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning. Father, we thank you so much for, for loving us, Father, for bringing us together. God, what, what an exciting day to be back in your house. With brothers and sisters, Father, being here today, Lord, we praise you for that. And we, we pray that you'll watch over us and protect us. God, we, we trust you. We stepped out on faith when we left the house. And Father, for those that are watching, Father, for our brothers and sisters that are home, God, we know that you're with them. Lord, we miss them, but we understand. And we, we know, listen, we're going to work this thing, whatever is, the, is best. And we're still together. And watch over them and keep them safe until they can be back to join us also. But Father, if there's anyone here this morning that does not know you, Father, I pray that they will give their life to you. And Father, for those that are hurting, God, the hurt, the hurt is real. That's why they call it hurt. God, it's so painful being betrayed by somebody that, 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 
that's close to you, a friend, a spouse, a child, a co-worker, even somebody that, that you don't know, Father, the, the, the hurt is very real. There, 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 there's a lot of pain there. And Father, we need you because we can't forgive on our own. But God, we need you working through our lives to do that every day. But we need to be mindful that, Father, that it's what you've called us to do. And when we forgive others that have hurt us, Father, that's when we're most like you. We're examples of your glory. We display that for the world to see. And we bring you glory so that others may come to know your forgiving grace. Father, help us to do that. Thank you for this day. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your mercy. It's in the precious name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Before we go, I have, I have one other little thing. Uh, Alexis, we, we have your certificate of baptism uh, that we haven't been able to present her. And so we want to do that. What I'm going to do is I'm not going to make you come up here and be all up here. I'm going to put it right here, okay? We're going to social distance you. <laughs> and I want to do one other thing, church. I'm going to take this right here. Oh. And all right, you at home. I want you to see all. Everybody wave. Wave to our people at home. We miss you. We miss you. We understand. And we can't wait to see you again. You have a great and blessed week. If you need anything, if you made a decision for the Lord, you can let us know. And uh, you have a great week.